Frequently, From Software fans have asked the question, what is the story of Armored Core? Do I have to have played the first five games in the series to be able to understand Armored Core 6? And generally speaking, what's going on in these games compared to something like Dark Souls or Elden Ring or Sekiro or Bloodborne? And I'm here to tell you, no. You do not need to have played any of the other games in the series, but what you should know is some of the common themes that are present all throughout the series from its very beginning with Armored Core 1. So today, we're going to talk about just that in preparation for Armored Core 6 being tomorrow. Let's begin. Hello everyone, my name is Tom, otherwise known as Titanium Legman. If you know me, you know my channel, you know that primarily I play strategy games, RPGs, JRPGs, and the intersection of those things, strategy RPGs. However, Armored Core is absolutely one of my favorite game series of all time. It's one of the games that I played growing up long before most people knew what Armored Core was. I'm a huge mecha fan. And I'm truly amazed that we're actually getting a new Armored Core game in 2023 and that it looks as good as it does. And I'm hoping to be able to eh, make some guides, some videos, some other stuff like this perhaps, if there's interest. So if you'd like to see more of that type of content from me, a subscription and a like, maybe even a comment saying you want to see more would be extremely helpful so that I know. Because switching genres and doing something outside your wheelhouse on YouTube is very difficult. So thank you in advance. Now, as far as Armored Core is concerned, why do I say that you don't need to have played the other games to enjoy or even understand Armored Core 6? The reason is because Armored Core reinvents itself and essentially resets its universe every few games. What that means is that we've had a few different, as we call them in the community, generations of game where everything starts fresh, everything is new, and there's only sort of some overlap in terms of theming and maybe some familiar characters that you'll see between those types of generations. Those generations are Armored Core 1 and 2 and all of their various spin-off sequel games, then Armored Core 3 and all of its games. Armored Core 4 and 5 exist within the same universe loosely. There's a few references to 4 in 5 that connect the two, as well as their spin-off games. And then now, Armored Core 6 seems to be set once again in its own continuity. But what about those themes that I mentioned? Well, let's look at something like, say, Fire Emblem. Most Fire Emblem games are not connected to one another in terms of story. A few of them are, but for the most part, they exist on their own separate continents or in their own separate worlds, and they tell their own separate stories. But they have a lot of the same types of things going on. Stories of noble families fighting amongst each other or fighting off evil cults or things like that. You typically start with a lord, a noble, who has a rapier or a similar weapon that is effective against cavalry and horses and all that type of stuff. Those are common through lines in all of those games. And in Armored Core, you're looking at a similar type of deal. The very first thing that you'll probably notice if you've been following the pre-release information for Armored Core 6 at all is the presence of mercenaries. Every playable character and every Armored Core story prominently features the role of the mercenary. Whether this be a solo operative or someone fighting under a larger banner organization or something along those lines, you're always going to see mercs in Armored Core. They can be known as ravens, as lynx, or now in Armored Core 6 potentially as hounds. And they are really the driving force behind the story. If there's something big happening, it's typically because there's a mercenary or a mercenary group involved. They fight for the major corporations, which we'll talk about in a moment. They fight for their own personal glory or rank in the arenas. They fight for money or for their personal goals. But whatever the case may be, they're the ones out there on the battlefield, in the mechs, laying down the business. Speaking of mechs, we're pretty much always calling them cores. There was a slight diversion in Armored Core 4 where they were known as Nexts more often than not, but the core is the playable character mech and is the type of mech that is going to be causing the most destruction on the battlefield. There are generally other types, MTs, that are more standard, low power, slower, grunt work troops, and then giant abomination walking fortresses, especially from what we've seen in Armored Core 6. But if there's like a bipedal unit on maybe the cover of the game, that's a core. That's what you can expect to be looking at. 
One of the defining characteristics of the Armored Core series and its mechs, other than just what they're called, is the extreme level of customization that you have over whatever it is that you choose to bring onto the battlefield. From your weapons, to the weight of your core, to the actual types of legs and arms that you use, there's an insane degree of customizability. And I want to quickly go through some of the various options that you have available to you so that you're familiar when you go into Armored Core 6 for the first time with what it is that you're looking at. And since, of course, the majority of the people who are watching this video and who are hopefully going to be playing Armored Core 6 probably only know Frum's games from the Soulborn series, we're going to talk about these different types of builds in terms of how they kind of equate to other builds that you could do in, say, Elden Ring. And I know, listen, fellow old heads who are fans of Armored Core, don't crucify me for this. I know these differences extend far beyond what I'm about to say, but for the layman and the From Software fan who hasn't played Armored Core, I think this will get the point across. So, first off, we have our standard bipedal humanoid design. These are two legs of various weights, light, medium, and heavy, and you can pretty much equate this to your standard versatile sword and border, right? If you're someone who plays your character with a decent balance between strength and dexterity, might have a bit of a mid-roll going on where slightly heavier armor, but you still have some dexterity and are able to roll around, get away from attacks, this is going to be the most familiar thing to you. Most cores that you see are going to be the standard bipedal design, and you can do pretty much whatever you want with this type of build. You can wield a bunch of heavy weaponry and have a slower, more tanky build. You can have maybe a light machine gun and a sword and light legs and jet around really, really fast and stay mobile, but be a bit of a glass cannon. Or you can just have that good all around mid weight that takes some damage, but not too much and deals out a fair bit of damage, but isn't loaded with the most heavy weaponry and get through the game just fine. Next up, we have our reverse joints or our chicken legs as people like to refer to them. Verse joint legs are also bipedal in nature, but as opposed to the more standard sword and board comparison, this is going to be a pretty intense dex build. This is a type of leg that is going to allow you to have a lot of high speed mobility with thrusters, jump very high very quickly, a lot of vertical movements, and you're going to see a lot of people making cores with this type of build that have heavy-duty artillery, lots of missiles that they can fly up in the air, get out of range, lock onto a bunch of targets, and then launch a barrage from the skies. Think North Star in something like Apex Legends or Titanfall, and that'll kind of give you an idea of what a reverse joint leg is going to be doing. Next up, we have tank legs, and as I can imagine you can surmise from the name, these are your heavy-duty weapons platforms. You've foregone proper legs entirely, and you're just sitting on tank treads. You can equip the biggest, heaviest weapons without getting overloaded. It typically can fire a lot of artillery cannons and similar things that would require you to be stationary with standard legs while you're on the move without any issues. And your best bet is going to be loaded with as many weapons that you can fire as fast as possible and for as long as possible. So you can just burn the enemy down while you sit there and hopefully not take too much damage. Your Soulsborne equivalent is going to be someone who's decked out in like full Havel gear with the dragon tooth. Super slow, probably fat rolling, but God, if your poise and damage aren't just through the roof, then I don't even know what you're doing. So, very fun type of build. I'm probably going to have at least one core that utilizes a tank build going in to Armored Core 6. Next up, we get quad legs, and this is where things start to get pretty kind of esoteric and weird. So, I'm going to relate these the most to your spellcaster type builds. Quad legs have a lot of speed and a lot of versatility in the fact that they can float around and generally stay airborne without using too much energy, without needing too strong boosters, but also tend to be rather vulnerable as a result. Having that sort of aerial maneuverability obviously can be extremely useful in navigating terrain and keeping just out of reach of your opponents while you rain fire down on them, but if you run out of energy or someone has really good aim, can dodge your attacks and then hit you while you're fairly immobile in the air, then you're going to be having a bad time, similar to a big sorcery build in Elden Ring that, man, might be able to launch some major spells at you from a distance, but if they run out of mana or you close on them before they're ready for you, they will be in a world of hurt. Finally, we get hover legs, and hover legs tend to fluctuate on whether they're present in Armored Core games or not, but this is going to be your weirdest stuff. I'm equating this to, like, going a full arcane build in Bloodborne, right? 
you use a lot of energy. These are typically going to be energy weapon based platforms that function similarly to a tank leg, but have a lot more maneuverability, but much, much higher energy costs as a result. There's a lot that you can do with hover legs, but they have big downsides. You need to be able to make sure that you can keep your energy generation up and you'll quickly find yourself as a sitting duck if you don't very closely keep an eye on your various meters and your resources. If you do, very powerful, but it's probably the most difficult or one of the most difficult types of builds to use, and I definitely would not recommend it for a starting build. As far as the setting of what Armored Core typically goes for, we will either have a future dystopian or post-apocalyptic setting, or maybe a mix of both. Oftentimes, this is due to it being a far future setting where the Earth or whatever planet the game happened to take place on, its resources have been drained, utilized for war and expansion, or rampant pollution has taken over due to capitalist efforts or colonization efforts or what have you. Or humanity is struggling to recover from some great war or apocalypse that happened in the past at the hands of AI or nuclear technology or just all out attrition warfare. Whatever the case may be, you're not typically seeing lush jungles and thriving urban centers in Armored Core. Things are desolate. They're not in a good state. And as a result, as I'm sure you can imagine, humanity isn't in a very good state either. That doesn't keep us from fighting over what's left. The people who do that fighting, other than the mercenaries, those are the powers that be in the corporations. Every story in Armored Core is driven by the desires of the major corporations. In Armored Core Nexus, my personal favorite game in the series, that's Crest, Mirage, Kisaragi, Navis, various different bodies that are the governing forces of the world because there is no government left because they've either collapsed or been taken over by the corporations. They're the preeminent military powers beyond whatever mercenary forces happen to be at play. And they're the ones who are also creating the AC parts that they're using to wage war. So really in everything but name, the major corporations are the governments of these worlds. And again, that's something that you'll see throughout pretty much every game in the series. In Armored Core 6, corporations are going to be front and center once again, as they're the ones who are sending us to fight over this rare resource that exists on Rubicon 3. And I can only imagine that if there is any sort of governmental oversight in the game, it's very limited or extremely ineffective, one or the other. The conflicts that those powers wind up causing typically center around the corporations fighting over resources, as I previously mentioned. They can also be fighting over territory using their private armies and mercenary armies, and they often find either lost technology or a strange new power source. That's what we can see in Armored Core 6 with Coral. And they are not afraid to bring extremely heavy weaponry to bear, along with more corporate politicking to get what they want. If a corporation wants something, it is not afraid to run over anyone and anything in its way to achieving whatever it is that it wants. So you really got to keep an eye out when the corporations start to get involved. As far as the rest of humanity is concerned, it's really not a great time to be a standard civilian. It doesn't really matter which game we're talking about, which generation we're examining. Regular people have it pretty bad. Due to the rampant pollution, the constant warfare, the scarce resources, the absolute overbearing power of the corporations, you're generally having a bad time. Whether you're just like a serf working God only knows what kind of hours to build AC parts and man factories and try to farm, I guess, you're not going to be living in the lap of luxury, that's for sure. These people are often relegated to remote colonies or fortress cities or even flying cradles in the sky and they can be stuck underground or stuck in these massive mega structures with nothing but blasted sand around them or again just up in the sky and the cradles at least in armored core 4 are a bit better uh the people who live in the cradles are generally the wealthy and well-to-do the important people of the world and experience some fairly nice luxuries at the expense of everyone on the ground where all of the resources are being 
shunted from those on the ground up to the cradles in the sky. So it's still generally not great, but a little bit more of a class disparity story. In general, though, you're working for a core or you're working on cores and it's not really a good life one way or the other. And that's before we even get into the human experimentation, which we might as well talk about now. You see, transhumanism is kind of a big deal in Armored Core. There's a lot of programs and research initiatives that the corporations and the powers that be take part in to try and build the better man-machine interface than their opponents and their contemporaries. This has been seen all throughout the series history, starting with the Human Plus program in the original Armored Core, which sees pilots being cybernetically combined with their AC to improve performance and allow them to do things that the standard pilot, no matter how well trained, just wouldn't be able to get away with. This, we're talking like cybernetically enhanced skeletons, nervous systems, all that type of stuff probably life system support built into the AC so that if it gets destroyed, well, I guess you're just SOL. It's not very good, but it makes for good warfare, and that's kind of the name of the game in Armored Core. Later in the series, this was changed over to the Op Intensify program, and while it's not as explicitly described as it is in Armored Core 1 and 2 with the Human Plus program, it's still something that's looked down on. It's kind of viewed as a way of cheating by forsaking your own humanity to gain an edge and killing power, and it's just not the way that they do things in Armored Core 3, where Op Intensify is most commonly seen. Jumping forward to Armored Core 6, it's clear that this whole idea of transhumanism and the man-machine interface is going to be front and center at the focus of the story. As we can see from the very first story trailer, what is presumably our character, our playable pilot, has a direct, potentially one-to-one -one connection to his core. We're talking like full-on cybernetics hooked up to the brain when he moves, the core moves type deal. This is someone who's been heavily experimented on, isn't even referred to by a name, but just as a serial number, and seems to be viewed as just another part in the machine that is the warfare in and on Rubicon 3. Now, what level of discussion there's going to be around that in the game remains to be seen. I certainly hope that there's going to be at least some pushback, some rediscovering our humanity as we fight out there on the battlefield, as that's always been kind of a revolving theme of Armored Core. What is it to be human? What is it to be a soldier fighting out here in these machines as opposed to just another cog in the machine? It should prove to be very interesting, and with the way From does their stories now, I can only hope that we're going to see some of that discussion, but... If you don't like body horror, you don't like things to do with like surgery and people being hooked up to machines and all that type of stuff, this might put you on edge a little bit. I can't imagine it's going to be super graphic Dead Space style, but this is probably the furthest we've ever seen them push the envelope in terms of this type of topic in Armored Core before. And I'm super excited about it because I love this stuff. Moving on from humanity at large and what's happening to humanity, something else to keep in mind, partially because of the PvP aspect of Armored Core 6, is the arena. In pretty much every Armored Core game that has ever been released, there is an arena, either a physical location or like a digital battlescape using pilot data where you will have one-on-one -on -one duels with variously powerful cores and their pilots. Typically, you'll be working your way up the ranks from an unranked position all the way through the various pilots and characters in the game, and they're progressively stronger and stronger mechs, trying to get money or parts or just ranks so you can buy better parts or get access to better missions, all that type of stuff. So expect to see in Armored Core 6 a smattering of duels in order to increase your prestige in the world of Rubicon as you progress through the story. And finally, in Grand From Software tradition, there's going to be some familiar faces. In terms of characters and things you might recognize from the Soulsborne series, the Moonlight Greatsword, or the Moonlight Sword, or the Moonlight Blade, depending on what game we're talking about here, is present in most of the Armored Core games. I can only imagine that it's going to be present in Armored Core 6 as well, so you can keep an eye out for that. Patches typically shows up, not all the time, but most of the time, as either a pilot or a core who you'll be able to fight. We'll see if he has a little bit more of that cowardly, smarmy bastard personality in 6, now that that personality's been solidified in the Souls series, but I'd be surprised if he didn't show up. And then there's a recurring villain that 
shows up in most Armored Core games, who goes by the name of Nineball. I won't talk about him or it, depending, too much, so you can experience it in all of its glory if it does show up in Armored Core 6. But generally, if someone's talking about the being known as Nineball, especially if you're going to be fighting it or encountering it in some way, be prepared. He will not hold back. He will not show mercy. And it will probably be a very good or very bad time, depending on how you look at things. And that, my friends, is my overview of the general themes that you should be aware of going into Armored Core 6. Given how much game dev experience FromSoft has attained over the years from the Soulsborne series, compared to when they last developed an Armored Core game, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a bunch of shakeups and things that aren't direct references back to the past of Armored Core, since the majority of Frums fans are not going to be familiar with the series. But this way, having watched this video and hopefully gotten some useful information out of it, you'll be a little bit more prepared and when something happens or someone shows up on screen or something is discussed, you'll go, ah, I recognize this. Tom talked about this. And if that happens for you, then I've done my job. I certainly cannot wait to get into Armored Core 6. By the time you're seeing this video, we will be a scant few hours away from launch, and I will be streaming the game in its entirety as fast as possible on my YouTube channel. So if you want to hang out while I play, whether you have played the game yourself, or you just want to see what all the fuss is about, come on by. We'll be live pretty much all day for the next few days until we complete the game. So I hope to see you there, and I hope that you maybe strike up a conversation with me there or in the comments here about Armored Core. With that said, again, my name has been Tom, otherwise known as Titanium Legman. Thank you all so much for watching. I do very much appreciate it. I hope you all have a good night. Stay safe and healthy out there. And remember, be good to each other. Bye now.